نحمده ونستعين ونستغفره ونؤمن به توكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله ولا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ما بعد continuing on our theme of refining our akhlaq our character in our previous khutbah we looked at surah al hujurat right the chapter of the rooms where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lays down for us some of the primary characteristics of the believer that we are supposed to be people who verify information we abstain from gossip we abstain uh, from name calling from mocking we abstain from racism we are united brotherhood we said that surah forms the foundation of islamic character another surah that plays an important role in shaping our character is surah an-nur and today inshallah we'll begin looking at surah an-nur and some of the lessons of akhlaq and character development that we can take from the surah now surah an-nur is much longer than surah al-hujurat so we might not be able to cover all of the lessons in a single khutbah but we'll do as much as we can to begin surah an-nur is a madinan surah and there are very clear reasons for revelation in fact the longest hadith in sahih al-bukhari is the reason for revelation of the surah right where the full story is mentioned by aisha radhiyallahu anha so this story we know when it was revealed we know why it was revealed and we know about whom it was revealed that there is a long story behind it and we'll go into that story in a different khutbah because that story itself will take up an entire khutbah right it is literally perhaps the longest story in the entire sahih al-bukhari but nonetheless just to summarize it that there was a scandal in that some of the hypocrites had spread a slander against one of the wives of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and people were starting to begin to people were beginning to believe the slander so allah revealed the surah where number one he clarified her chastity that she is an innocent woman and the people were slandering her and number two Allah reveals for us a set of rules to follow that if we follow these rules a we won't fall into sin b no one will be able to slander us right these are social rules for how to live with others in a way where you protect yourself from all sides when it comes to these kinds of evil that is the evil of committing the sins that people were slandered of and also the evil of being slandered right that we avoid situations where people can slander us so this is a very comprehensive surah and it covers very important aspects of our social etiquette specifically in dealing with the opposite gender and with dealing with family and this surah is so important that some of the sahaba would recommend that you teach this surah to your daughters when they are around the age of puberty right when they get to the age of puberty that they sit with them and explain to them the teachings of surah an-nur because these are very important social elements of our religion that if we follow them we will live lives that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so surah an-nur where does it get its name from an-nur is taken from the most famous verse in the surah right the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes his guidance as a light right the famous verse Allahu nuru samawati wal ard Allah is the light of the heavens and earth. This verse is the most famous metaphor in the entire Quran. There is more commentary on this metaphor than any others. And that too will have to take up a separate khutbah, just like the reason for revelation. Because that verse really there is layers upon layers of meaning to it. But just to give a simple meaning related to our topic, Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in this verse through a metaphor that his guidance, the Quran and Sunnah are like light upon light nur al nur these lights they light up your life they chase away the darkness of sin they chase away the darkness of ignorance and they light the way to paradise so you must follow the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so it's calling upon us to follow the guidance of the surah and of the Quran and sunnah in general so let's go through some of the social aspect uh, aspects that are covered in this surah and how we can relate them to our daily lives now the opening sections of the surah deal with the two main prohibitions that the surah came down with right first is the prohibition of zina and i'm sure every adult here knows what zina is right and every child here when they're the right age the parents should teach them what zina is but zina is clearly prohibited it is a major sin and uh, in this surah a a penalty is laid down for zina 
an actual physical penalty of a hundred lashes. So it shows the severity of the sin in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's important for us to talk about that because we live in a time and a place where this sin has been so normalized that people don't even think of it as a sin anymore. So we have to emphasize that it's not just a sin, it is one of the major sins. It is right up there with the top, top three major sins. After shirk and murder, the third greatest sin is zina. So it's a major, major sin. We have to remind ourselves and our communities of that. Then it switches over to the other prohibition, the other side. Just like it is a major sin to commit zina, it is also a major sin to accuse others of zina. It is a major sin to slander, to gossip, to spread rumors about people. And a penalty is laid down for those who slander and, gossip and, and uh, spread rumors about people as well. And of course, this, this set of verses is directly related to the incident for the reason for revelation. That the uh, hypocrites of Medina had spread a slander against our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. And because of the slander, Allah reveals the surah. Right, clarifying her chastity, clarifying her purity, her, her piety, and at the same time laying down these laws. That if people had to slander, this is the punishment. In this world, what the punishment is, and in the next world as well. So again, we stop there and think about this. Right? Stop and think about this. How quick are we to spread slander today? It's like we live in a day and age where people are guilty until proven innocent. That's how the world has become. That anyone can post anything about somebody else on social media, and the whole world believes it before it even goes to court. This is a very dangerous mindset. Understand that one of the fundamental principles of our religion that the rest of the world adapted after us is that people are innocent until proven guilty. This is a fundamental principle of our religion. People are innocent until proven guilty. So be very careful when people are sending around WhatsApp messages or TikTok videos or tweets accusing this person of that sin and somebody else of another sin. Don't join the gossip circles. Keep your tongue safe from gossiping about others. Over the past few years, we have seen hundreds of people's lives ruined by slander. Complete slander, things that have been completely false without an inch of truth. Just because somebody else wanted to take them down or ruin their careers or get revenge on them for something. So as believers, we have to be very careful. Do not join gossip circles. Do not listen to what people are talking about others. Do not go around slandering people. It is better to focus on oneself and avoid looking into other people's sins at all. And there's a variety of verses in the surah related to the evils of gossip, or the evils of slander, and the evils of enjoying this. That, that's an interesting point that Allah brings up, that some people enjoy this. They get joy in gossip and slander and lear, le, learning about the latest drama. It's as if he's, he's, he's describing modern society, as if he's describing the social media phenomena, where all the people are just gossiping about each other on social media and sharing all kinds of rumors. Allah says, "Inna al-lazina yuhibuna an tashi al-fahisha tu fil lazina amanu lahu azabun alimun fi dunya wal akhirah." That those who love to see this, this, the, these trials amongst the believers, this immorality amongst the believers, they love to see it spreading amongst the believers. They will have a painful punishment in this world and the next. So Allah is warning that if you take joy in seeing immorality spread. If you take joy in, in hearing about the downfall of others and, and, and the gossip and slander of others, then you will have a punishment in this world and the next. So what is the solution? Stay quiet. Avoid getting involved in other people's drama. It goes back to what we mentioned last week from Surah Al-Hujarat, right? To have husnul dhan of others and wala tajassasu, don't pry into other people's private affairs. Rather, focus on your own self. Then we are given a very fundamental principle linked to all of the topics in the surah, which is Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la tattabi'u khutawat shaytan O you who believe, do not follow the footsteps of shaytan. What are the footsteps of shaytan? It is those little things that the devil makes us do that lead to bigger things. You see, the devil doesn't just walk up to a righteous person and tell them to commit a major sin. No, he starts off with small things. Little crumbs, little footsteps. You do those small things, it leads to something else. It leads to something else and eventually you find yourself in major sins. So to cut yourself off from any major sin, Allah says, don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. Don't open the doors for evil. And then Allah lays down for us how to avoid these, what seem to be small things that lead to big things. A lot of the rules in the surah, if you don't understand the context and the wisdom, 
They may sound trivial. They may sound very, very minor. But when you understand it in context of this verse, they are very important. They are closing the doors to the footsteps of shaitan. So there are many verses in the surah about the uh, about certain aspects of etiquette and manners that are there to stop us from having any kind of uh, problem at, uh, uh, problems in our social life. The next verse is very interesting because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse is actually addressing Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu directly. It's a very interesting story. right? So the story behind this next verse is that when Aisha radiallahu anha was slandered, one of the people sp- spreading the slander about her was her own cousin. And this cousin was financially supported by her father Abu Bakr. So when the news came out that his, his nephew is slandering his daughter, he promised never to give money to his nephew ever again. It's a very human and understandable reaction, right? But Allah expects better than that from the righteous. Allah expects the righteous to be on a higher level. And so a verse was revealed directly for Abu Bakr anhu that all of us can apply. Where Allah says, وَلَا يَأْتَلِ أُلُوا الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَسَعْتِ إِنْ يُؤْتُوا أُلُوا الْقُرْبَ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْيَعْفُ وَالْيَسْفَحُ أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهَ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ He said, let not the wealthy and people of status amongst you, meaning Abu Bakr, he's wealthy and a person of status, let them not deprive their close relatives who are poor immigrants from wealth. Do not, do not deprive your poor immigrant relatives, referring to his nephew who was an immigrant, poor and a close relative. In say, Allah says, وَالْيَعْفُ وَالْيَسْفَحُ Forgive and overlook. Forgive and overlook. A fundamental principle of family relationships in Islam. Forgive and overlook. Why? Why should you forgive and overlook something so major from a family member? Slandering your own daughter. Why should you forgive that? Not for them. For yourself. Because what did Allah say next? Allah <laughs> tuhibuna lakum. Don't you want Allah to forgive you? Don't you want Allah to forgive you? If you want Allah to forgive you, Forgive your family members who have wronged you. That is the message of this verse. A very important social etiquette that again is forgotten in our times. Many of us don't realize this, but the breaking of family ties is a major sin. And that's why when Abu Bakr was going to do this, Allah revealed a verse specifically for him. Saying that yes, in your case you have good reason, but it's still better to forgive and overlook. It is still righteousness to forgive and overlook. And the reward for forgiving a family member when you know they are wrong and when they are definitely wrong and they have definitely caused you harm, the reward for still forgiving them and maintaining family ties is that Allah will forgive you for your sins. So there's a strong incentive there to uphold family ties. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us that anyone who slanders righteous women, they are cursed in this world and the next. Cursed in this world and the next. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَرْمُونَ الْمُحْسَنَاتِ الْغَافِلَاتِ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ لُعِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَلَهُمْ عَزَابٌ عَزِيمٌ Those who slander, chaste, innocent, believing women, they will be cursed in this world and the next and will have a painful punishment. It's very interesting the, the choice of adjectives used here to describe the believing woman and more particular Aisha radiallahu anha. Muhsanat means that they have never committed a sin. In a, in related to in this area of sin. They have never committed a sin when it comes to these things. But ghafilat is even stronger. Ghafilat, which is often translated in the English translation of the Quran as ignorant, it does not what ghafilat means. Ghafilat means that the thought of these sins don't even cross her mind. She doesn't even think about these things. The thought of, of committing a sin in this area won't even cross her mind. She has such pure heart, such pure thoughts. And Allah is telling us that this is the benchmark of femininity, that a w- woman should aim to be someone who is muhsinat and ghafilat. That she's not just chaste, but these thoughts don't even cross her mind. That she has a pure heart that focuses only on the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the standard to aim for. That was the standard of Aisha radiallahu anha. And Allah is saying people who accuse women like that of evil, those people are cursed in both worlds. They are cursed in both worlds. The surah then goes into the more social aspects, right? It then switches gears from talking about these prohibitions to what seems to be very trivial social laws, but which are actually very important and forgotten in our times. Beginning word, a very simple rule that we forget. And that is, if you're going to somebody else's home, do not enter their home without permission. You know, the, the idea that this is in the Quran. Why is the Quran 
telling us do not enter somebody else's home without permission because a lot of people simply don't do uh, don't follow this rule even though it may be common sense to many of us but there are people who don't follow this rule there are people who just walk in and out of other people's homes Right? That they feel like, oh, he's my neighbor, they're like family to me, and they just walk into somebody else's home. And then they end up might seeing something inappropriate or seeing somebody dressed inappropriately. It could cause problems. Right? So Allah reveals this. Again, the, the point here is, La tattabi'u khudawati shaitan. Do not follow the footsteps of shaitan. Anything that could open the doors to following the footsteps of shaitan is prohibited in the this, in this surah, including just entering somebody's home without permission. That you and someone else may be best friends. But if you enter his home without permission, his wife could be in the house not dressed properly, his daughter could be in the house not dressed properly, and that can cause all kinds of problems. So something as simple as this is mentioned in the Quran and emphasized in the Quran, where Allah says, Ya ayyuhallazina amanu, la tadkhulu buyutan ghayra buyutikum, hatta tasta'anisu wa tusallimu ala ahliha. Look at how specific it is. Oh, you who believe, do not enter homes that are not your own without seeking permission and greeting its, the people inside. Two things. Seeking permission and greeting them. Seeking permission, you, you ask, can I come inside? And greeting them, you hear who is inside the house and they know who is outside the house before letting you in. Right? That the greeting is there. And then Allah goes further. He says, He says, if you don't find anybody home, don't enter it. Don't enter somebody else's home without permission. Don't enter it until you are given permission. Don't enter somebody else's home without permission. And really, when you go into the hadith, the ruling is even more stronger. Not only are you not allowed to enter somebody else's home without permission, you're not even allowed to look into their homes without permission. You're not even allowed to peek into somebody else's door or windows without their permission. This is a violation of their privacy. One of the things you learn from Surah Nur, Islam is very strong on privacy laws. Everyone has the right to their home being a private place where what goes on in their home is nobody else's business. You're not allowed to look inside, you're not allowed to enter without permission, you're not allowed to spy on them. People's homes should be their safe place. And so these rules are made very explicit in the surah. May Allah guide us to practice it and to follow it. Subhana rabbika rabbil izati amma yasifun. Wassalamu ala mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillahi wahda wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'd amma abad wa inna astaka al-hadithi kitabullah wa khayru hadhi hadhi muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sharru al-umuri muhtathatuha wa kullu muhtathatin bid'a wa kullu bid'atin dolala wa kullu dolalatin finnar We said the surah is very comprehensive and we'll probably split it over two or three khutbahs But the next two verses are very important Very very important aspects of how we interact with the opposite gender and these verses, you know, what we find in our communities, people either go to an extreme in understanding them or they ignore them completely. But we need to understand them the way that the early Muslims did. So the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Tell the believing men to lower their gaze and to protect their chastity. This is purer for them. Inna Allah khabirun bima yasna'oon Allah is aware of everything that you do. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lays down two commands for the Muslim man. Right? And this makes it part of manliness to follow these commands and to be a real good Muslim man, the kind of man that women want to marry. Right? And what are these commands? Number one, you protect your chastity. That you are a chaste Muslim man. You don't do things outside of what is halal. And number two, you lower your gaze. Now this is the part of the verse where there's a lot of difference of opinion on what it means and there's a lot of misunderstanding of it. So to put things simply, what does lower the gaze mean? Lower the gaze means you do not look at someone in a lustful manner. You do not look at them in a way that incites your lusts. Now the kids won't understand what I'm talking about. When you hit puberty, you'll understand. Right? No one will need to explain it to you. But simply put, every adult knows what it means to look at someone in a lustful manner. Right? And what it simply means is don't look at people like that. Meaning, if you are looking at someone because you are teaching them or you are doing a business deal with them or because you, you, know, you have some genuine interaction with them, that's not problematic, that's not wrong, that's not necessarily a sin. But if there is this lust that enters the heart, if there is this wrong thoughts that's entering the heart, then you should not be looking at them. And there's a special kind of stare that men have, right? That is the lustful stare. Everyone knows it. Everyone knows what kind of stare that is. So men should not be looking at women in that way. But the next verse says also that women should be dressing in a way that men don't look at them like that. And again, there's two sides here. And 
Very often you only focus on one side. We have some communities that only focus on how the woman should dress and some focus, a community that only focus on the men lowering the gaze. But our religion is realistic. It covers both sides. It tells the men to lower their gaze, but it also tells women not to dress in a provocative manner. And again, people have forgotten this in the modern era, that when we tell Muslim women to dress in a way that is appropriate, you have these ideas of you can't tell me what to do, a man can't tell me how to dress, but this is not from me, this is not from a man, this is from Allah. The next verse, Allah himself tells women how to dress. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then tells the woman, وَكُلِّ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغُدْنَا أَمِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ وَيَحْفَزْنَا فُرُوجَهُنَّ Tell the believing woman to lower their gaze and to protect, protect their chastity. Right? It's interesting, Allah tells the men to lower their gaze and He tells the woman to lower their gaze. Why are these two mentioned separately? Number one, because there is a stronger emphasis on men lowering the gaze because men tend to be the ones who use their eyes incorrectly. Right? But the, then the reminder is there for the woman as well because sometimes women also fall into this. Right? Especially in the modern day and age, uh, with, me, so with the way the media is portraying men and women you know, in uh, these very uh, lustful ways, that even women fall into the, into the sin of staring at men lustfully. So, the prohibi- so Allah is saying even though this is more emphasized for men, it's still there for women. Women still also have to control their gaze and make sure they don't look at men in that way. Right? And obviously they also have to protect their chastity. But then there's an extra command in this verse for women that's not there for men. So this is in the Quran. Allah says, "Wala yubdina zinatahunna illa ma zahara minha," and they should not expose their beauty except what is necessary. They should not expose their beauty except what is necessary. And of course, there are the different opinions amongst the ulama as to what this means. But again, they have the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where when he, he spoke to his sister-in-law Asma, he told her that when a woman reaches puberty, nothing should be seen of her besides her face and hands. So that hadith gives you the explanation of this verse. What is necessary? The hadith says face and hands is fine. Right? So from there we get this opinion that a woman should cover everything except her face and hands. An interesting uh, point I'll end on. Uh, nowadays we call that hijab. Right? And the argument that the other side make who tell women you don't need to dress like that, the argument they make is they say that hijab is not mentioned in the Quran. Now this is what they say. Now there's a technicality here where they're technically right. You know why they're technically right? Because calling that hijab is a modern idea. It's only in the past hundred years we start calling that hijab. Before that, we just called it covering your aura. We just called it dressing Islamically or dressing modestly. We never had a word for it. So the Quran tells women, cover everything except what is necessary. And the Prophet said, what, what, what is necessary, you can allow to show, off your, face, show your face and hands. Right? So this is established in the Quran and Sunnah. They just never use this word for it. They never use the word hijab for it. So when someone says hijab is not in the Quran, we say the concept is in the Quran, it's just the word is not there. That using this word in this context is a modern usage. Because the word hijab comes in the Quran, for example, to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That there's a hijab between him and the creation. There is a barrier between him and the creation. That's the context the word comes in. So again, this is people playing around with words. That yes, technically the usage of the word in this way is a modern usage, but the concept is there from the beginning. The Quran has this concept, the Hadith has this concept, every madhab has this concept, and this has been part of our religion from the beginning. They just never use the specific word for it. So, if people saying that, that, that this word hijab is not the Quran, say, okay, fine, but the concept of a woman covering everything besides her face and hands is in the Quran. And it is in the Hadith, and there's ijma on this amongst the ulama, so we should follow it. We must follow it. Whether you want to call it hijab or not is, is not important. The name is not important, the word is not important, the concept is important. Following the Quran and Sunnah is important. You know, we shouldn't get caught up in names and labels. Let's focus more on what does Allah say, what does the Prophet say, and let us follow that. So we'll stop on that note, and we'll continue with the tafsir of the surah uh, next week, where we'll go into the next set of verses, which continue to discuss some of the rulings and etiquettes related to homes and visiting others, and how we interact with members of the opposite gender. It's a very, very important surah. Uh, it helps to shape our social character. We ask Allah to guide us to understand these surahs properly, to apply them properly, and to live by them. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Okay, salat.